So apparently we don't have a countdown this week. How very thoroughly disappointing. Don't know what's don't know what's wrong with it. It according to the video panel when I bring it up, it is the intro video that we have. You know the eclipse sequence. Do 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 you know that we usually have the music and the countdown timer, five minutes. Regrettably, what that means is, or maybe it's I don't know if you think it advantageous or not, it means that you have my ugly face for five extra minutes this week. Um, yeah, no idea what's wrong with that. So please, uh, just to make sure that there isn't anything else wrong with the stream, if you're now seeing me and you're now hearing me, can you please maybe indicate that in the chat, that you're seeing me and hearing me okay? Because I have no idea what's going on. But anyway, it's one of those gremlins. You know those little gremlins that get into the uh, technology? I find, funnily enough, those gremlins don't affect my writing when I'm using an old manual typewriter. <laughs> funny enough, those gremlins aren't an issue. <laughs> All you need is paper, ink, and a bit of light. And hey, presto, job done. Anyway, a very good evening to you. A little bit earlier than uh, planned because of said countdown video not working. Uh, let me just try one more time. Not that it's I'm not going to play a 10 minute. So it mutes me and then it's as if it's playing. It's not playing. Anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, good evening. Welcome to my Irish Meets. This is episode number 239. Tonight we're starting a new book. That is. First, I've had a look at the early pages of it, and I think you'll certainly find tonight's uh, episode interesting because it deals with uh, themes that would be very familiar to us and we've dealt with on lots of episodes. Anyway, before I start, just to say, uh, welcome everybody. If you're watching on uh, Facebook, feel free to give the old video a like, the live stream a like. Feel free to share it to your own Facebook profile. If you're watching on YouTube, of course, please do subscribe to the Mythical Ireland channel and ring that little notification bell so that when we're doing future live streams and videos, new video uploads, you will get notified. If you're watching on either, please comment, please engage in the chat. And of course, if you say hello, we'll be saying hello back to you as always, as we have done since the very first episode on the 12th of March in the year 2020. First comment tonight, not surprisingly, is our regular first commenter is Elaine Dent Lingenfelter, where uh, there is a, a very high temperature of 104 Fahrenheit or 40 Celsius in the heart of Texas. Well, I don't know how you stay cool, uh, Elaine, but stay cool. I don't know if that involves turning the air conditioning up full, putting your head, head in her freezer, uh, putting a bag of ice cubes on your face. I have no idea, but I hope that you can cool down somewhat. Joe Butler, Auntie Joe is in Colorado where it's hot and windy. Hoping the rain comes as predicted later this week. How is everyone? Hope it doesn't come in the amounts that it's coming in California right now. All I can say is uh, we can't blame John Maine for that because he's in Cyprus. No, he's not. He's in Crete. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, yeah, hopefully you'll get the rain, Joe. Uh, Samantha Healy, we had a pleasant day in Ireland, but it was warm and breezy. Samantha Healy is in the house. Good evening, Anthony, Tom, and all the two are from the beautiful Cooley Peninsula. Brilliant stuff, Samantha. Hope it is nice down there, as it always is. Wayne Bard is in the house. Good evening to you, Wayne. Thank you for joining us, as always. You're very welcome to the stream. Robert Brown is watching. Hi, Anthony Murphy. Hello, Robert. Uh, the closest viewer to me currently. Round the corner, I could hang my head out the window and shout, and he'd hear every word. Marsha Downs, hello to this grand community. Slauncha, well, it's good to see you, Marsha. Hope you're in good form. Welcome to the latest in a long line of live streams. Uh, Johnny Wilson is in Dallas, Texas, looking forward in watching the program today. Uh, yeah, and I hope you're keeping cool as well. Um, seeing you and hearing you, brilliant stuff, and Rex. Fortenberry says the same thing. We didn't say hello to you yet, Rex. So, Trinonoa, Slauncha. Thank you, Samantha. See and hear you, Joe Butler. That's all good. So that, that end of it's working. The intro video wasn't working. All good from South Dakota, says Helen Hirsch. 
Shader. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me. What? What is it doing? That's so random. <laughs> I tried to play that three minutes ago. Well, more than three minutes ago now. Uh, no idea what's going on there. Apologies for that. We're not doing the countdown timer this week. It's acting up for some reason. Now, where was I? Yes, loads of people saying they see me. Uh, Her Hel Helen Hirsch Chader. I got the name, the correct pronunciation on a recent Zoom uh, chat with same Connie Reader. Uh, we see you, Connie. Well, we see your icon and you're watching on YouTube. Uh, thank you, Marcia, for checking other places. All, all good, says Robert. Um, good stuff. Valerie Galler is listening while hoeing the lettuce fields at the farm. Wow. Isn't it great that we have portable devices that, you know, we don't have to be sitting. Do you remember years ago? Some of you will anyway. Some of you are old enough to remember, like I am. We used to have a television and you have to be, had to, had to be, if you wanted to watch a program, you had to be at the television at a certain time. No such thing as this pausing TV and playback TV and Netflix and TV on demand. And I even remember the time before remote controls when you had to get up off the chair and twist a knob or press some buttons to change the channel. <laughs> anyway, Valerie has a obviously a portable device and headphones or ear earpieces and is listening uh, while hoeing the lettuce fields. Wow, that is some picture. You need to take a picture of that and, and post that on the Mythical Ireland community. Thank you, Auntie Joe, for sharing to the Mythical Ireland community and Mythical Ireland creatives. Uh, Kathleen Gallagher says, hello from New York, overcast, near 90. Not too bad a day so far weather-wise. Well, come here. If it doesn't get too hot and it doesn't rain too much, that sounds like a good day. Uh, Samantha can't hear me talking. My uh, youngest son is uh, um, looks like he's practicing drama in the sitting room. Anyway, uh, Barb Jordan, hello, Barb. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. Uh, Rex is saying uh, greetings from a broiling Louisiana. Got my peppermint tea and ready to rock. FYI, from last week, Bossier City is pronounced Bo Bossier City. Louisiana has a lot of strange names around. It, would that be from? That, that pronunciation be French by any chance. Uh, Bossier. Uh, Barbara Murphy, hello to the two from a cool, cloudy Tucson, Arizona. We are at the extreme edge of the East Co Coast hurricane. So expect it to be under 90 F 36 C. Yes, I can hear you and can hear you, can hear you and can hear you. But the countdown was playing. I know, annoying, huh? And McCallum is in the house. Hello there. Hello. Hope everyone's in great form. Very much enjoyed your talk. Can mythology tell us anything about the Boyne Monuments, Anthony? Thank you so much for sharing with it with us on Patreon. Brilliant stuff, Anne. I'm glad you enjoyed that. An hour and a half long, but only for patrons at the Iron Age level and above, just in case. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, the address to support uh, Mythical Ireland uh, patron is on scrolling on the screen constantly. And now Mythical Ireland is also on Buy Me a Coffee if you don't want to become a monthly patron a monthly uh payer as it were or subscriber as it were uh you can make a one-off or whenever you have it chuck a few quid and uh the address there is buymeacoffee.com forward slash mythical Ireland. well thank you and glad you enjoyed that talk um new kind of well new material as in it's a talk i haven't given before so um Looking forward to giving that to future audiences. Billy GW is in County Cavan. Peace and love. Well, same right back at you, Billy, watching on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Billy, you're very welcome. All the above to keep cool and keeping the power company rich, says Elaine. I can imagine. Yes, indeed. Uh, Adina Sparks is saying, hello, hot and humid day, but no sign of rain. Glad to be inside spending time with everyone. Well, we're glad you are here, Adina. You're very welcome, as always. I moved to Tucson, says Barbara, many years ago from New Orleans. And uh, I had one of the ladies on my tour today, a private tour I was leading in the Boyne Valley. It was from uh, Tucson, Arizona. There you go. Heather Marie Leaning is in the house. Good evening, Anthony. Hello, Tom, if you're here or watch 
watching later missed the start i know that tom is in the rds is a busy day a uh, busy few days at the home something exhibition i can't remember the name exact title of it but i know he was busy i was speaking to him this morning and um, he was anticipating a busy day adrian obeglin is in the house evening anthony Everton. hello adrian Glad you enjoyed the Tommy Cooper joke, er, joke earlier on. Teresa Collins has joined us from County Kerry. Go on, the kingdom. Teresa, you're very welcome. Burr Whelan is in the house uh, and uh, is saying it's a lovely evening in Dublin. Believe it or not, over the past hour, a thunderstorm has rolled past to the north of us here, out into the Irish Sea. I did hear a little bit of lightning. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, it seemed to get very active as it went out into the sea and... Uh, Seems to have dissipated now, hopefully. But there are some big, dirty, black-looking clouds out there still. Burr, glad to hear it's a nice evening in Dublin. And Scott Doherty's in the house. Hope everyone's well. We're okay here. Almost had to evacuate last night due to a wildfire about half a mile away. My God. Hope you're okay, Anne. And, uh, yep, yeah, stay safe. Absolutely. Uh, and Connie is in Illinois. Well, a very good afternoon to all our Illinoisan friends. Peter Kennedy is uh, saying hello from Balia Brigin, a Gunde Auclair. Looking forward to watching this evening's show with a huge pint of iced tea. Wow. Can I can I have one of those? Sounds nice. John Main is in the house. Looking forward to another enlightening evening. Uh, just talking about another type of light, enlight, lightning, uh, which is the lightning that you get from the clouds. Seems to have moved off into the sea. John, apologies. I know I have to get back to you um busy few days uh so we'll catch up soon uh sandra boothroyd is in the house good evening sandra Trononawa. jay brown is in the house hello and good evening well welcome to you also watching on youtube lily shambles five four three two one we're on there's your countdown hi all brilliant stuff lily thank you for that uh oh yes sandra is asking what about the uh the lead that were connected to your video player and the remote control that holding in your hand and a long, long wire. Oh yeah. Remember that? Do you remember having to program a VCR player to record at a certain time? <laughs> Josie Weatherford is in the house. I did I see you were doing the PW Joyce book? Yes. So excited. I love that book. I have read I have and read both volumes. I'm not sure if volume two is in this. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. No, this is just volume one, and I don't think I have volume two, so that's um, something I will have to uh, address, shall we say. Good to see you, Josie. Nice to see you the other day, too. Lily Shambles, do you remember uh, on the Newgrange Farm Tour? Lily Shambles, do you remember when the first remotes looked like modern-day basic computer mice? I know, we've come a long way. Ah, there's Tom King. We've come a long way, haven't we? Tom King, speak of on Goa, and he arrives on your doorstep. Hello there, Anthony, and good evening to the mighty Tua from Balia Clea. I'm on show duty in the city, and it's going great. Looking forward to story time. Enjoy all. Brilliant stuff, Tom. Glad to hear it's going well, and that you're pacing yourself. Remember, it's a marathon, you know. Uh, Kevin Donovan is saying hello from a hot Texas. Uh, yes, Apparently, it's 104 in uh, uh, where Elaine is, which is, I think, is around uh, uh, Dallas. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, Amy Wallace Dolan is in the house. A uh, good evening uh, and good evening to you, Amy. Thank you for joining us. Lynn Foley is in El Paso, where it's 93 F or 33.8 C, which is about the highest temperature ever recorded in Ireland. It was I think 33.3 Celsius or something like that yes 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 indeed arc astronomy database is in the house hi friends good evening to you ty great to see you uh, no joy with uh lock crew anna l says good evening anthony and the two of a very good evening to you anna l thank you for joining us fergal canton is saying it's a lovely day in dublin ah sure isn't it always a lovely day in dublin eh uh, no it's not says you uh, Sarah Dawson Sr. is in Leeds. Good evening to you, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Or is it Sarah? Sarah or Sarah? Uh, Fergal says, I saw thunder straight after, straight after. Uh, you saw a flash of thunder straight after a rumble of lightning. I heard lightning. I saw thunder. Uh, Paul Campbell is in Galway City on the Atlantic West Coast of Ireland. A very good evening to you, Paul. Paul, the most regular viewer, Irish viewer of the No Name Trivia Show and uh, a great supporter. 
Uh, Joan Schroeder is in Newport in Oregon. Hello, Joan, and a very good afternoon to you. Just about, I think it's just after midday there, if you're in Oregon. Um, Hallie B04, who is Sue Prenter, is uh, watching uh, on YouTube. Hope everyone is well. Good evening to you, Sue. Thank you for joining us. Good on this side. Those of us of a certain vintage, says Samantha, can recall scanning the TV times for planning record, rec planning record show input the code <gasps> excuse me yeah yeah complicated thing k is in the house on youtube hello k and i wonder if we'll be joined by t as well as k uh but there you go k you're very welcome and irish technical thinker is in the house also marcus you're very welcome to the stream shasta bize is saying the hurricane in los angeles was a nothing burger but the high desert got well hit wow uh we are on 58 viewers wow that's not bad uh and i'm caught up with the comments so anyway all i had to say was what i've said already in terms of supporting ireland um yeah uh and actually i should uh, i should add that if you become a Patreon, a Patreon patron right now at patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland, um, say for instance, at the Bronze Age level, uh, just for instance, to give you an idea of what you can look at, what's been shared very recently, is I'm now sharing two pages at a time of the draft typescript of the Return to Segish Companion instead of just one. So now it's two pages at a time because I've over 200 pages written and uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm not sharing them fast enough to catch up. Uh, pictures of a meeting with Tony Robinson five years ago. Um, yes, so plenty of pages from the uh, Segish Companion. Uh a, an article that was published in one of the papers about the moon show on TV, uh, the study of the lock crew and four knocks bones uh, typescript, which I typed on my typewriter for the benefit only of the patrons. Um, uh, the don't forget the draft cover of the four knocks uh, monograph. Um, and the uh, recent podcast and there is a video there are video updates too that i was looking at the last patreon update video update and only four views had only it only had four views which i was surprised about because it was available to a lot more than four people did the two of the Dannon or the early gales have any writings believing the world was a globe or flat if they're able to track the sun surely they know about curvature I can't answer that. And the two of the Danon didn't have writings. The two of the Danon are sort of a mythological people. They feature in the early writings. Um, don't think there's anything particularly mentioning a flat earth, but I, I can tell you one thing for sure, uh, that the Neolithic astronomers had a lot of things figured out. Wouldn't surprise me at all if they knew about the curvature of the earth. Uh, Chungus Khan is uh, saying, I hate being late, so ignorant and rude to others that have been here on time, always detracting from the lectures. Oh, woe is me, let all. <laughs> but I did tell you, uh, Chungus, this is a no brown zone. There is no need to apologize. People are late. It's not a university lecture. It's not a you have to be here at a certain time or you will be punished sort of thing. We're glad to have your company. And actually, I haven't started reading yet. Yes, my thoughts exactly. Brilliant stuff. Uh, we're on the same page there, says you. You're looking a bit sun-kissed there. Yeah, I spent a day leading a group of uh, American visitors around uh, Nowth and Newgrange and Douth today. And it was a gorgeous sunny day in the Boyne Valley. And now there's big, huge, big, angry black clouds gathering. Well, I suppose at least I got the sun uh, today and out again with the same group tomorrow. So, yeah, got a bit of the sun. Anyway, shall we leap into it, as they say, and see how we get on with uh, P.W. Joyce's A Social History of Ancient Ireland. Now, is there anything by way of introductory material? Well, there's his preface, which is very long. I don't know whether I'll read that. Will I read that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a bit. Mm, I'm not sure. 
let's let's read a bit of it and i'll see i'll gauge from how i feel about it and what kind of reaction i'm getting from you good folk and uh you good people and uh you wonderful supporters of live irish myths um and if i think it's a bit boring i'll skip it and we'll go on and just read the, the uh, first section proper deborah gilbert is in connecticut where it's sunny sunny for now anyway <laughs> yeah it was sunny here but funny now the uh the dark clouds are gathering um guess what i was reading last night random right random the chapter called helm's deep from lord of the rings the book i know right Sotonar says, given that there was supposedly a great deal of philosophical contact between the Greeks and the Celts, at least according to some Roman sources, especially among, among the Pythagoreans, I'd bet that one way or another, they'd figure out that the world was round. Yeah. yeah. No preface, says Amy, jump straight in. Yeah, I think I might do that, actually. Now that you've given me that sort of permission. Let me just read a couple of paragraphs of the preface, just to give you a flavour. And if it's immensely boring, we'll skip it. An important function of history is to depict social and domestic life. Is that boring already? No, of course, it's fascinating. It's thoroughly gripping, Anthony. If we wish to obtain a clear view of the general state of any particular country in past times, we shall need to have a good knowledge of the people, high and low, rich and poor, their standards of civilization, religion and learning, their virtues and failings, their industries, occupations, and amusements, their manners and customs, and the sort of life they led day by day in their homes. Yeah, we'll skip it. I've got to brush up on my Gaelga. Duolingo has forsaken me yet again, says Chungus. Forsaken you in what way? Did you not pay this subscription? Is it like only allowing you to do a certain amount? I don't know. Or is it just that you, you're, you're not, you, you don't like it? It's not giving you the uh, instruction that you thought you wanted from it. There's Samantha Healy saying, Tom's booth in Dublin looked great. Yeah, because he shared nice pictures of it. Amusements, like roller coasters, asks Marcus. <laughs> I don't think he's talking about that kind of amusement. Pop probably fickle boards and such things. Listening to stories, actually. Helm's Deep is one of my favourite bits of the entirety of the Lord of the Rings mythos, says uh, Sotonar. Yeah, um, and it's funny uh, reading it back now. It's a good while since I've read that chapter, uh, how it compares to the movie and, and the sort of liberties the movie takes. The movie helps me when I'm rereading Lord of the Rings to picture things that I found it difficult to picture originally. That I know Tolkien's depictions are fabulous. They're very rich. But even at that, it can still be difficult to picture a scene, you know. Anyway. Um Oh, good. Yes. And this is chapter one called Laying the Foundation. Section one of chapter one is called Native Development. Are we ready? Are we comfortable? Here's a good uh, recommendation. Uh, on Shamok, which I believe means the fox, isn't it? And Patchy have great videos on YouTube on Irish. Patchy should show up if you search Patchy Irish. Brilliant. Not to be confused with Apache, which is a type of Native American Indian. Tom Byrne is in West Limerick. Good evening to the All-Ireland Champion County. Is that right? Am I right? Limerick are the All-Ireland uh, hurling champions, aren't they? Or did I get that wrong? I'm not much of a GAA fan, so forgive me if that's a mistake. The horn of Hammerhand will sound in the deep one last time. Yes! <laughs> yes, indeed. The institutions, arts, and customs of ancient Ireland, with few exceptions, grew up from within, almost wholly unaffected by external influence. The exceptions will be noticed in the proper places in this book. This is a very good start from P.W. Joyce. I'm really liking that because we've got a, some modern scholars who think that almost everything uh, that was created uh, in manuscript form in the Middle Ages uh, was was an external influence and imported, you know, uh, which is, uh, as I say, a great start. I'm happy now. The exceptions will be noticed. Yes, yes, yes. The Romans never set foot in Ireland. What did the Romans ever do for us? Uh, the aqueduct, <laughs> education, sanitation, the roads. Yes, nothing because they never came to Ireland. 
though their influence was felt to some slight extent, either by direct communication or indirectly through the Britons. And of course, in that regard, we have first and third century AD coins that were left probably as votive offerings at Newgrange uh, in those early centuries AD. Somebody from the Romano-British world had visited a Newgrange. And I see those dark clouds are looking very dark. The dark clouds are looking. Yes. I don't think I'm up to Tolkien's uh, measure in terms of my description of the, uh, the sky. The first foreigners to appear as invaders were the Danes who began their raids about the beginning of the ninth century. Um, of course, mythologically speaking, we have uh, a series of invasions, uh, you know, uh, Kezair and Partholon and Nemed, Nemed and uh, Tuadadan and Fervolog, etc., etc. Though they harassed the country for about two centuries and established themselves in many parts of it, especially on the coasts, they never brought it under subjection. And of course, we previously did a number, at least one anyway, but uh, a number of episodes about the Battle of Clontarf and the Vikings in Ireland. Uh, they are available if you search the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. You will find that we did the Vikings in Ireland part one and part two were episodes 171 and 172. Oh, sorry, we have part three and four as well, part uh, episode 174 and 175. On, in 176, we did uh, Dermot McMurrow and the Normans. And of course, he kind of was the Irish king who invited them into the country. Um, and if you're interested in general in early Irish society, we did an episode called Early Irish Society, 1st to ninth Centuries. And that was episode number 186. And the YouTube channel, of course, is youtube.com forward slash mythical Ireland. And they effected no changes of any consequence in the customs or modes or of life of the people. Uh, I'm not sure that modern scholars would agree with that. Uh, for instance, um, the Vikings are credited with founding the city of Dublin and minting the first coins in Ireland. And one of the changes that seems to be attributed to them is that they uh, transformed Ireland from a cattle-based economy to a grain-based economy on account of the fact that their boats could transport grain over long distances. Peter says, I must learn more about the Vikings in my hometown of Limerick. Yes, indeed. Diane is in the house from Bossier. Bossier. How, somebody told me how to pronounce this earlier and I can't remember. Is it Bossier? Is it French? Bossier City in Louisiana. A good afternoon, Diane. Thank you for joining us. Tom Byrne is in the house. I am reading from, it says there at the top of the screen, it should do. A Social History of Ancient Ireland by P.W. Joyce, Patrick Weston Joyce, uh, Volume 1, published uh, 1903. I was reading Technical Thinkers 1014, which is the Battle of Clontarf, and it was, I was thoroughly confused. I was about to say published 1014. Tolkien continues to influence today, and what's not discussed so widely is how he might have been influenced by Irish uh, landscape and mythology. David Powderly's in the house. You're very welcome, David. Good evening to you. And Le Leanne Delaney is also here. Hello to you, Leanne. You're very, very welcome. Ah, okay, Chungus. That's a good explanation of what's going on with your... Uh, uh, your. Um, I was about to say Patreon. It's not Patreon. You're using the language thing, Duolingo. Yes, 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 yes. Sometimes the brain is uh, a bit slow. Now, where are we? Next came the Anglo-Normans near the end of the 12th century. But though this was a much more serious invasion than that of the Danes, you should tell all the monks and, and other people that the, the Vikings killed. And by the way, they weren't the Danes. We now know, uh, thanks to uh, modern DNA studies, that the Vikings who came to Ireland were mostly Norwegian, not uh, uh, Danish. 
So we could, should call them the Norse, not the Danes. So there you go. And though these newcomers continued to make settlements in all various parts of the country, the Irish people still adhered everywhere to their native customs. In other words, even though the Normans were here, uh, the Irish, uh, the natives kept to their, their own practices. Indeed, it is well known that, except in a small district around Dublin, the settlers generally intermarried and became incorporated with the natives, adopting their language, law, sorry, laws, plural, dress and usages, so as to be quite indistinguishable from them and becoming more Irish than the Irish themselves, which is something that is often said about the Normans, that they eventually became quite Norman, you know, quite, quite Irish even, Antony, not Norman. Didn't Ireland invite the Normans? They did. And if you want to hear more about that, uh, you would be looking for our live stream, which was about Dermot McMorrow and the Vikings, which was episode number 176. And I will paste the link into, into the comments for you so you can see that. Watch it later. Bookmark it and watch it later if you haven't seen it. You probably watched it at the time. But uh, just for those who... Uh, haven't seen it before and maybe might be interested in watching it. Alwyn Roy Badziak is in the house. Clear skies here in Reading Burks. Brilliant stuff, Alwyn. Send it round the place. Quick, what culture influenced the Viking symbols? As in the runes. Uh, their own Scandinavian culture, I'm surely. Um, not enough of an expert to answer that, Mark, in fairness. Uh, but good afternoon to you and thanks for joining us. Accordingly, for several centuries, the Anglo-Norman colonization had no more effect in altering the general state of society than the Danish invasions, <laughs> for Danish insert Norse. And matters went on very much as of old till the time of the Tudors, when English influence at last made itself felt. And of course, when we mention the Tudors, we're talking about the period in which the Treaty of Maliphant was signed, the flight of the earls and the first plantations. Ah, a sup of boiling water. Thank you, Bowen, for your refreshing and inspiring uh, liquid. Then the old system of tribal land tenure began to be changed for the English custom. And with the abolition of the Brehan Law and the substitution of English law in the beginning of the 17th century, it may be said that the old order of things in Ireland was broken up. But even after this, most of the ancient native customs remained, and indeed many remain to this day. Of course, this book written 120 years ago. Yes, not forgetting, Marcus, thank you, the Battle of Kinsale, the disastrous Battle of Kinsale in 1601. King Ivar of Limerick is said to have been a grandson of the legendary Ivar the Boneless. I find some of those um, Viking names very funny. I remember telling you about uh, Citric the Squinty, who I believe was involved somehow in the uh, in the Dublin Vikings. Or was he involved in the Battle of Clonturf? Or was that another Citric? Uh, but Citric the Squinty, very funny. In the long lapse of ages, there were, of course, changes and developments from time to time. Many new modes, fashions and usages gradually grew up while others fell into disuse. But the main institutions and customs of the country retained their hold with astonishing tenacity. So that in some aspects of society, a description of the state of things as they existed in, suppose, the 15th century, would apply equally well to that in the 6th or 7th. Wow. <laughs> Pardon me. Now, do bear in mind, as all times when we're reading this, a little bit of a caveat, shall we say. Do bear in mind that this was written in 1903 and a considerable advancement in our knowledge of these, uh, especially medieval period, the mediev mediev medieval period, uh, has been advanced since then, uh, uh, or uh, has been made oh. since then, an advancement in our knowledge. Coda says hello to all the doggy lovers. Um, uh, so there would be modern scholarship that would, uh, shall we say, um, at least question, if not overthrow some of what's said here. Many, many illustrations of this might be given, but one will be sufficient here. It was customary with the ancient Irish poets 
as will be described further on, to make circuits through the country, visiting the houses of the principal people and receiving payment for their poetry, besides welcome and entertainment. So that's interesting. The poets used to make a circuit, visiting, of course, the well-off people who are their patrons and sponsors, as it were, composing laudatory poems for those who received them well, uh, panegyrics maybe, and lampooning those who refused them. This remarkable custom is mentioned in innumerable passages in both the lay and ecclesiastical literature as existing in the most remote pagan times. Uh, and of course, we have evidence of, at least from mythology, of the first satire being the one uh, that uh, was made against Bress uh, because uh, the two of the Danon went away uh, from, or, pe or people in general went away from uh, Bress without their breath smelling of ale and without their knives being greased by pork or whatever. Um, it, it, it was not in the least affected by war or invasion, but continued uninterruptedly from age to age down to our own time, as may be seen by reference to chapter 11, section 5. Well, that's a good bit ahead. We might get to that for a long time. So remember that. You uh, take a note of that now immediately, all of you. That we have to go, we have to specifically refer back to uh, page four and five of chapter one when we get to chapter 11, section five. Elena Breen is in the house. Good evening. Good evening, Elena. Very, you're very welcome. Uh, Koda, yes, indeed. Les Marion is in the house. I didn't say hello to you, I don't think. Uh, is laughing at something, presumably something, <laughs> definitely not something I said. No way. Um, and Rex is saying, uh, howdy. But one momentous effect of the Danish and Anglo-Norman invasions must here be noted. They arrested the progress of native learning and art, which, though disturbed by the Danes, the Norse, still lingered on for several centuries after the first English settlements, but gradually declined and finally died out. Ireland presents the spectacle of an arrested civilization. What that civilization would have come to if allowed to follow out uninterruptedly its natural course of development, it is now impossible to tell. And unless to conjecture, and unless to conjecture. But there is no reason to think that in this respect, Irishmen would not have kept well abreast with the rest of the world. One object of this book is to present the intellectual and artistic state of the country when at its best, though still imperfect, namely from the 7th or 8th to the 11th or 12th century. And we are now beginning chapter 1, section 2, which is called Evidences from Literature. The evidences relied on throughout this book are derived from two main sources literary records and material remains. The literary works used as authorities are referred to in the book on uh, as occasion arises, and they are all named in one general list at the end. But as they, oh, it is extremely dark now, really black clouds. But as they vary greatly, both in the value to be attached to their testimony and in point of antiquity, it may be well at the outset to give some idea of the kind of evidence we obtain from them and to indicate in a general way how far they are to be trusted as guides for our present inquiry. So this is good because this is the standard fare of anybody studying uh, medieval Ireland and ancient Ireland through the lens of medieval manuscripts. And that is, it comes again with a caveat, with a warning that, look, not everything is as it seems in the manuscripts. It helps to be aware of the political and social and religious structures of the era in which a lot of this stuff was written down. Two main points I wish to bring out clearly in this short chapter. First, the authenticity and general trustworthiness of the evidence. Second, the period, thank you, Coda, the period or periods of the country's history to which this evidence applies. The literary records may be classed as follows. Lives of saints, martyrologies and other religious writings, romantic literature, 
the Brehan Laws, Glosses and Glossaries, Annals, Genealogies and Local Historical Memoirs, and the works of English, Anglo-Irish and foreign writers. These several classes will now be briefly examined. And I hope you find this interesting. I did, when I skirted over it, uh, and sped read it uh, today, I did think that this material would be interesting in light of a lot of the things we have discussed on live streams in the past, in light of stuff that's on the Mythical Ireland website and in my books. So first of all, he deals with lives of saints. The lives and other written memorials of the Irish saints, most in Irish, some in Latin, of which great numbers are still preserved in our manuscripts and of which many have been published, form a very important source of information. That's interesting. I, if you had asked me were the lives of saints in Irish or Latin, I would have said most in Latin, some in Irish. He says here, most in Irish, some in Latin. So I would have been wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> the oldest documents of this kind are the original memoirs of St. Patrick. The principle of these are the two documents now generally admitted to have been written by Patrick himself, his Confessio, or the Confession, and the Epistle to Coroticus, both 5th century. And two others, the memoir of the saint by Morku Maku Macht. Uh, Machtini, uh, Murku being an Irish name for Murphy, and the notes by Tirakon, both written in the 7th century, but embodying traditions of a much earlier date. These are the of the highest authority, but they, uh, they do not give us much information regarding the social life of the people. Next in point in antiquity, but more detailed and more valuable for our purposes, is the Latin life of St. Colum Kill, written in or about AD 695 by Adavnon. Colum Kill was the founder and first abbot of Iona, and Adavnon was the ninth abbot. Both were Irishmen, and the illustrious establishment over which they presided was an Irish ecclesiastical colony. Adavnon uh, was a great sorry, was a writer of great dignity and integrity. And his pictures of the daily life of the people of Ireland, Scotland and Iona, both lay and clerical in the sixth and seventh centuries, though not very full, are absolutely trustworthy so far as they go and most valuable as being the earliest detailed accounts we possess. Of course, this is worth bearing in mind when people come to this whole thing about Christianity and oh, 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 we hate the Christians. Look what the Christians did. Right, grand. Okay, um, the modern church um, has a lot to answer for in Ireland. In the 20th century in particular, it has a lot to answer for. However, what I was going to say here, it is interesting how uh, ecclesiastical records uh, can provide keen insights into lay affairs. They didn't just write about church people and church affairs. I mean, we've had lots of episodes, a cluster of episodes in the past about the annals, where we learn all about kings and battles and all of the other stuff and, and eclipses and astronomical happenings, in addition to the births and deaths of saints and clerics and bishops and all the rest. The Celtic people who inhabited the western coasts and islands of Scotland were descended from Irish colonists, as will be shown in Chapter 4, Section 1, another note to remember, and intimate intercourse was kept up from the beginning between the two countries. The two peoples were in fact identical, having the same customs, language and modes of life, so that Adovnon's descriptions of the Scottish Gaelic people apply equally to Ireland. His remarks also about the daily life of the northern Picts, whom he converted, may be applied with little or no reservation to the Scots or Irish, for we know that the Picts lived much the same sort of life as their neighbours, the Gaels, both of Ireland and Scotland. Fascinating. Hope you're uh, enjoying all of this so far. I am. The Britons are often mentioned in Irish writings, for there was much intercourse between them and the Irish in early ages, so that they often intermarried. 
uh, chapter 4, section 1. Tacitus, writing in the end of the first century, states <coughs> that there was little difference between them in disposition, manners, and customs. And as corroborating this, we find that the British customs identically noted, noted, noticed by Irish writers are found to be generally identical with those of the Irish themselves. <coughs> Excuse me, I hope I'm not going to have a... I hope I'm not going to go horse. And then I'd be like a Shetland pony or a Connemara pony. I'd be a little horse. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Get serious, Anthony. Speaking of which, there'll be a couple of jokes before the episode's over. Here it may be proper to remark that many ancient Gaelic customs that have died out or are only faintly remembered in Ireland are still preserved with most of their antique features in the islands and highlands of Scotland, of which several examples will be given in this book. From Martin, Pennant, Scott, Carmichael and other uh, delineators of Scottish manners. The desolating wars in Ireland especially those in the time of Elizabeth, that's Elizabeth I, uh, in the era of the signing of the Treaty of Mellifont, signed a few days after her death, at which time when Hugh O'Neill signed the uh, Treaty of Mellifont, he did not know she was dead, in which the country was almost cleared of inhabitants, broke, as it were, the cont continuity of the race, so that many old customs and traditions were neglected and forgotten in Ireland, which in Scotland have been preserved without a break from the time of the earliest colonists to the present day. The great majority of the saints whose biographies have been preserved flourished in the period from the 5th to the 8th or 9th century. But it is well known that in the case of most of them, though not of all, long intervals elapsed after their death, intervals often of centuries, before uh, the memoirs of their lives and acts, that is, those memoirs that are now extant, were committed to writing. Very important to say that when you're dealing with the lives of the saints, that the lives were written sometimes several centuries after uh, the uh, person had passed away. Love the dead man. <laughs> uh, Josie, don't encourage me, honestly. Uh, Mesmerly Anthony's daddy over here. Ah, uh, yes. <sighs> Doesn't go down well here in this house. They all just look at me when I crack a, a joke like that at the dinner table. They just stare across, going. And then you see the tumbleweed blowing through the room. Okay. A vast proportion of the ancient books of Ireland were destroyed by the Danes in the 9th and 10th centuries. It's interesting if it was a vast proportion. Now, there was a study being undertaken in recent years by a group of academics who were looking, trying to use various means, including some mathematical mathematical formulae, to try to determine what, what kind of portion of books were destroyed by the Vikings. And I don't think it was as much as Joyce is saying here, a vast proportion. Uh, it was a substantial amount, but mm, interesting. And among them, no doubt, numerous original memoirs of saints, so that the later biographers had to depend very much on verbal tradition. Well, it was verbal tradition that saved a lot of uh, mythology over the uh, centuries and aeons anyway, wasn't it? These compilers constructed their narratives as best they could, under great difficulties, collecting their materials from remnants of written records in the several monasteries, from the scanty entries in old annals, genealogies and other such documents, and largely from oral tradition, the most uncertain source of all. Well, I disagree with you there, uh, P.W. Patrick Weston. Um, I would not say that oral tradition is uh, the most uncertain source. I certainly would not agree with that. Though constructed around a framework of truth, these lives, as they have reached us, are much mixed with legend and fable. A circumstance which detracts from their value as mere historical records, though it does not at all affect our researches. Apologies, I'm just checking stuff on the other screen and I should concentrate. Moonshore Donna. 
The long intervals account in great part for the marvelous element, for oral tradition tends in the slow lapse of ages to magnify everything and to attribute all unusual occurrences of past times to preternatural agency. Yeah, and, and to be honest, if you've seen my um, uh, article about St. Patrick, um, I'll find that for you and share it with you. Uh, and it's called, well, it's got, sorry, just trying to, yes, remember my place here. Um, the myths and legends of St. Patrick. Um, I did say that a huge amount of what we have in the uh, descriptions of the miracles, for instance, of St. Patrick and the things that he was supposed to have done appear to be mythological, you know. Anyway, there's that if you want to read it later. Susan Scott is in the house. Hello, Susan. You're very welcome. Kathy May Dayo has also joined us and is on uh, lunch, I presume. Stay safe, all to it in Southern California. Uh, yes, indeed. And anybody who's being affected by wildfires and all the stuff that's going on at the moment and, and the hurricane. There is good reason to believe that the biographers committed to writing faithfully the accounts they received, whether from tradition or written record, truth and fiction alike, without adding or distorting. But taking these old lives as they stand, we are generally enabled by an examination of internal evidence and by careful comparison with other authorities to distinguish fact from fiction. At least in the case of the matters dealt with in this book, the main thing that concerns us. Distinguishing fact from fiction. Interspersed through the narratives, there are frequent references to dwellings, furniture, dress, ornaments, occupations, customs, pastimes, food, and many other concomitants of the everyday life of the people, which are incidentally mentioned with all the marks of truth and reality. The fact that these brief records are incidental, casual, and unintentional is what stamps them with authenticity and gives them their value. When we follow the guidance of these sidelights, using ordinary circumspection, we are pretty sure to keep on safe ground, even though many of the main incidents related directly are fabulous or doubtful. I will illustrate these remarks by an example. In the Irish life of St. Bridget, is that cogitosis or the other one, uh, Vita Sancte Brigitte? Uh, it is related, I presume it's the Vita Sancte. It is related that on one occasion, soon after she had settled in Kildare, Eileel, King of Leinster, passed near her establishment with a hundred horse loads of peeled rods. Whereupon Bridget sent two of her girls, presumably two of her nuns, to ask him for some of the rods. But he refused them. Forthwith, all the horses fell down helpless under their loads. And there they remained, unable to rise, till Eileel granted Bridget's request, on which she released them. The Irish narrative adds, incidentally, that it was from these rods that St. Bridget's house in Kildare was built. How ironic. And that is uh, related in Stokes's three Irish homilies, Stokes being Whitley Stokes, <coughs> who was one of the most prolific Irish scholars. And now the sky is clearing and I'm seeing a uh, blue sky, but a uh, blue after sunset sky. It's nine minutes to nine and the sun has already set. That is the coming of autumn and winter not too far behind it. The days are growing short, my friends. Almost 20,000 subscribers too, says Marcus. That is, I presume, the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel, which is, I believe, at 19,900. Come on, get more subscribers. Let's get it over the 20,000 mark. Interestingly, I wonder if Eileel was the same Leinster chieftain who um, re refused her land for her monastery. And she, he said, you can have as much land as your cloak will cover. And she took her cloak off, brought the breach, placed it on the ground, and it expanded and covered what is now the plain of 
the Curro, which is a very large area measuring several miles by several miles. Passing by as foreign to our purpose, the miraculous part of this story, which was the thing mainly in the mind of the writer, we may infer from the rest that in those times it was the custom to build houses of rods or wattles, cleaned up and peeled before being used. Wow. And there is abundant evidence elsewhere to show that this would be a correct conclusion. <clears throat> Bearing in mind that the customs and habits of a people change slowly, that the original biographers must have had written authority of a much earlier age for some portion of their statements, and that the dates of the com composition of the lives or other memoirs range from the 5th to the 14th or 15th century, we shall be safe in assuming that these incidental allusions generally represent the state of society existing in Ireland from the time of the commemorated saints down at least to the periods of the writers. This incidental testimony is specially noticed here in connection with the lives of the saints, but in reality it pervades all classes of Irish writings, as will be seen as we go on. Along with the lives of the saints, we may class martyrologies and calendars, hymns, sermons and other religious writings which should be specified and referred to whenever necessary. Romantic literature. The ancient Irish tales, historical and romantic, which are described in some detail in chapter 15, furnish our next group of authorities. Actually, let me have a look at Sorry, apologies for this. I just want to look at chapter 9. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Good. Um, we could potentially be reading this for many, many, many episodes. A large proportion of the stories are contained in the book of the Dun Cow, Laranahira, of course, which you've mentioned many, many times, which was transcribed about the year 1100, and in the book of Leinster, transcribed on in or before 1160, and others are found in later manuscripts. All these books were copied from much older volumes, and there is good reason to believe that the principal stories were committed to writing at various periods from the 7th to the 10th century having been handed down orally for ages previously by the professional poets and Shanachis. Though the stories are partly or wholly fictitious, they abound, like the lives of the saints, in incidental pictures of real life, which, speaking generally, are as true and consequently as valuable for our purposes as if the main narratives were strictly, uh, his, his, excuse me, strictly historical. It is, however, necessary to observe that when we have to deal with the direct descriptions of men and their surroundings found in many of the heroic romances, direct and intentional descriptions as distinguished from casual or incidental, we must be cautious in accepting statements and careful in drawing conclusions from them. The heroes and the events which are the subjects of these tales belong for the most part to the first three or four centuries of our era, and some are assigned to a much earlier period. The old romancers who committed the stories in, uh, to writing many centuries later magnified and glorified everything pertaining to their favourite heroes and have left us gorgeous descriptions of houses, furniture, arms, dress and ornaments of which a great number may be seen translated into English in O'Curry's Lectures on the Manners and Customs of the Ancient Irish. In the case of most of these, uh, no one would seriously think of accepting them as literal, sober truth. They merely embody the Shanachis exaggerated conceptions of the great champions of the heroic ages, like the Homeric descriptions of Greek and Trojan heroes. <coughs> Moreover, these direct descriptions so far as they are to be credited, as well as indeed as the incidental references, must be taken generally as applying to the time of the original writers, or a little earlier in the case of each individual writer, namely from the 7th to the 10th century, though, as we shall see, a good proportion of them apply to a much earlier period. One thing, of course, that we must be careful about when we're reading uh, a, a mythological tract that was written down in medieval times is 
if you've read uh, J.P. Mallory's In Search of the Irish Dreamtime, uh, for example, uh, and other works, but that's the one that sticks out immediately. He talks about how the the dress and the weaponry, uh, you know, and the appearance of people sometimes is a, as it was in the era that the story was written, not as it was in the era from which the story is said to originate. Uh, Caitlin Moon is in the house. I suspect Caitlin will enjoy this an awful lot. And of course, you probably have this book, uh, the two volumes, and you probably read it from top to bottom. Um, but uh, good evening to you. Yeah, Josie is pointing out less. so many times they say everything was made of gold. And they give um, the two of the Dannon, uh, you know, uh, metal and and, 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 and and weapons of and, and bronze and, 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 and all of that and gold and all that stuff. And uh, that sort of throws away my contention that the two of the Dannon mythology goes all the way back to the Stone Age. But we may err on the side of excessive scepticism as well as by undue credulity credulity the most exaggerated description if read in the right way and checked and tested and toned down by other authorities may yield solid information and in regard to ornaments and equipments that the shanakis did not often invent but merely magnified is proved by the fact that in our museums we have weapons and ornaments answering to most of those described in the stories though generally on a scale less magnificent. Mere creations of imagination as well as gross exaggeration can be eliminated, eliminated or brought down to the solid level of reality by rigorously adhering to the rule of accepting nothing that does not of itself appear reasonable or that is not corroborated by other authority. All the old tales have been transmitted to us as remarked elsewhere, chapter 15, section 1, by Christian copyists who have in most of them, though not in all, added on, as it were from the outside, Christian allusions. Uh, and we have talked about this repeatedly and on many, 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 many occasions, leaving the general pagan framework almost unchanged. Accordingly, even those of the tales that show Christian influence are full of pagan ideas and of references to pagan customs, while some are thoroughly pagan in character without a trace of Christianity. So that we may safely apply with due discrimination many of the features of social life in the oldest tales to a period much earlier than the 7th century. Many of the tales will be referred to as we go along, but as exemplifying how much may be learned from them, I will here mention one piece contained in the Lower Breck, the vision of Maconglina, which was evidently written by a skilled epicure, and which, though purely fictitious, has afforded a vast amount of information, undoubtedly authentic, especially on food and drink, and on the various modes of preparing, cooking, and presenting them at the table. Professor Kuno Meyer, this, uh, sorry, the editor, believes that this tale began to assume its present form about the end of the 12th century, but that the original and shorter narrative was written at a much earlier period. And he doesn't say which period that is, by the way, which is a little bit annoying. The Brehan Laws, now this is a new section. Pardon me. I'm getting distracted again, not good enough. The Brehan Laws. In the ancient laws of Ireland, we have another rich mine of materials. These laws or customs grew up among the people from the very beginning of society and took cognizance of them from almost every conceivable point of view following them as it were into their very houses and laying bare to view the details of their home life they professed to regulate social and domestic relations of every kind as well as professions trades industries occupations and wages 
As laws, they err in being too minute, but this very defect renders them all the more valuable for our purposes. The two most important of the Brehan Law tracts are the Shanachas Moor and the Book of Achill. In Cormac's glossary, a document from the 9th or 10th century, the Shanachas Moor is quoted and referred to several times as a well-known work, even at that early time. And as further showing the great antiquity of the text, it may be mentioned that many of the terms occurring in it had, when the glossary was compiled, fallen so much out of use that they are included among the obsolete and forgotten old words needing explanation. As to the Book of Achill, it is generally admitted that it is at least as old as the Shamachus Moor, probably older. Other portions of the written law, including the commentaries and glosses, are, however, much less ancient than these, and some are not older than the 15th or 16th century, though no doubt they transmit traditional interpretations of a much earlier time, NB. And that's very important, that they may have been written down in a particular century, uh, but that they may record uh, material that is much older than the century in which they're recorded. Desiree is in the house. Coda has already given his uh, hello barks. He has earlier on made a little bit of noise, but a uh, very good afternoon to you, Desiree, and of course, Amadeus. Uh, you're all, of course, as always, very, very welcome. But this important fact must be remembered. At whatever times the ser several tracts of the laws were first written down, it was merely transferring to parchment usages that had been in existence for centuries. For the customs of a people take long to grow and still longer to establish themselves as laws. NB. It seems evident, therefore, that the information regarding social life supplied by the laws taken as a whole applies to a period coinciding in great part with that covered by the lives of the saints and the romantic literature a period reaching in some instances as far back as the date assigned by tradition to the original compilation of the Shanachus Moor, namely the time of St. Patrick, i.e. the 5th century. A few of the legal rules and decisions laid down in the laws are obviously unreal and fictitious and hardly intended to have any application to practical life. Some seem to be mere intellectual problems invented to show the cleverness of the writers or to test the ingenuity of the learners in solving theoretical difficulties. A practice, by the way, not peculiar to the ancient Irish, for one may find examples of it elsewhere, even at the present day. But such cases form only a very small portion of the whole body of the laws, and they are easily detected. The laws, moreover, are sometimes per perplexingly inconsistent, which probably arises from the fact that many of the tracts transmit to us local customs of different periods or from different parts of the country or perhaps the decisions of different jurists. But these unrealities and inconsistencies chiefly concern those persons who study the laws as legal documents. They hardly touch our inquiry and so far as the objects of this book are concerned, the laws as a whole may be taken as representing faithfully the actual state of society. Eamon McDonough is saying hello from a hot Chicago. Good evening from the Boyne Valley. Good afternoon to you, Eamon. Thank you for joining us. Caitlin Moon, fun fact. We can often date texts due to grammatical inclusions that can be traced to a specific time. Yes, indeed. And we don't have much material or any in Old Irish, but we know Old Irish existed because we see the Old Irish in Middle Irish manuscripts. There's T. Hello. Who was it joined us earlier? Was it K? We have K and T now. Brilliant stuff. Uh, T for everybody, please. Anybody on herbal? Um, peppermint here. Thank you very much. Glosses and glossaries. The ancient Irish glosses and glossaries, which will be found described in chapter uh, 12, have been all turned to account 
especially the glosses in Zeus's Grammatica Celtica and the glossaries of Cormac uh, McCullinan, O'Cleary and O'Daverin. And Cormac uh, O'Cullinan uh, was the, or McCullinan was the King Bishop of Cashel who wrote Cormac's glossary. Zeus's glosses, that's Z-E-U-S-S -S apostrophe S, um, with the corresponding Latin phrases are given fully by Zimmer in his book Glossae, Glossae Hibernae, Hibernicae, sorry, and the whole of the Irish glosses, wherever found all over Europe, including those of Zeus, are brought together with English translations of the old Irish passages in Thesaurus uh, uh, Apaleo Hibernicus by Drs. Stokes and Strachan. Cormac's glossary contains a great deal of authentic and most valuable information. Many of the words in it had uh, in it had then, that is in the 9th or 10th century, become so antiquated as to be unintelligible to the generality of readers. And the numerous customs mentioned must have taken many generations to grow up. Extraordinary stuff. Hiya T, says Lily. We're just waiting on Max now, as in TK Max. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I like it. The notices of manners and customs found in this glossary may accordingly be taken to apply to a period extending backwards for several centuries, i.e. a period generally coincident with that covered by the preceding three classes of authorities. Cormac's glossary is, for my purposes, somewhat like a cake of highly concentrated food, a, a pemmican or desiccated soup, dry and unattractive looking, but yielding under proper treatment plenty of intellectual uh, nutriment. It abounds in references, illustrations, indirect allusions and quotations from archaic lore, all very brief, relating to history, law, Romance, Druidism, mythology, handicrafts, domestic life. Showing the writer to have been a man of exceptional powers of observation and illustration. And I think that for its size, I have obtained more information from this book than from any other. To about the same period or earlier, and for much the same reasons, may be ascribed the information derived from the glosses, most of which, according to Zeus, were written in the 8th century, and others in the beginning of the 9th, while some of the oldest of them have been assigned by other continental scholars to the 7th. And then we come to annals, histories, genealogies, etc. Besides the classes of writings already noticed, there are annals, genealogies, local memoirs, historical poems, and such like, all helping to accumulate evidence. Among the later writings in the Irish language are three local memoirs translated and edited by O'Donovan, that's uh, John O'Donovan, and uh, I one assumes, and on the district and people of uh, Hifiachroch in Sligo, and uh, another on Haimani, or the O'Kelly's country in Galway, and the third on uh, uh, Corkaluja or Corkalee in the Odr O'Driscoll's territory in South Cork. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, L-U-I-D-H-E would be uh, uh, Louis Corkalui. Yeah, well it's anglicised as Corkalee. Corkalui. Corkalui. These describe, apparent apologies for that. These describe the people of the three several districts, their government and modes of life in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. One great value of these comparatively late tracts consists in this, that they fully corroborate the evidences of much earlier writings and show that the habits and customs of the older times were preserved almost unchanged down to the period of the writers. Although this book professedly deals with Ireland before the Anglo-Norman invasion, 1171, it will be observed that I sometimes notice matters belonging to much later periods and later authorities referring to them are often quoted. But the object of this is clear enough to illustrate the earlier history. A statement in a late book asserting or implying the prevalence of a certain custom at the time of the writer, though it could not be accepted of itself as evidence of the existence of the same custom at a period several centuries earlier, might corroborate a similar record or incidental reference in an ancient document which, if unsupported, could be too weak 
or un, pardon me, or uncertain to warrant a conclusion. The late authority in such a case is something like a flying buttress erected so, to sustain a weak or yielding old wall. Both will stand by mutual support where either, if left to itself, might fall. A good example of this sort of corroboration is uh, Frossart's account of the custom of knighting boys at seven. This, sorry, there is yet another source of information existing in the Irish language, the loan words from other languages. But this branch of the subject has not yet been sufficiently investigated by philologists to be turned to much account. And accordingly, I have made little use of it. Somebody was mentioning that, weren't they, on... Was it the uh, Mythical Ireland community during the past week? Somebody was mentioning loan words and gave a list of them. I can't remember who that was or what that was about. Uh, Caitlin Moon, I actually lolled at the intellectual nourishment line. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> English and fartin writers, or foreign writers in, in this part of the world, sometimes we call foreigners fartiners, the fartin. The authorities hitherto referred to are all native. In early Greek and Roman writings, there is not much reliable information about Ireland, which was in those times very remote and hard to reach before the days of Ryanair. The stories regarding Ireland in those days are more hearsay reports and often remind one of the Greek accounts of the Cimmerians, Cyclops, uh, Scylla, the uh, uh, Charybdis, uh, the harpies and so forth. I may have butchered one or two of those pronunciations for which I apologize. For example, Salinus, a Latin writer of about the third century, states that there were few birds in Ireland, that there are no such things as bees in it, that dust or small pebbles from Irish soil, if taken to other countries and scattered among hives, will frighten away and banish all the bees. In like manner, Strabo has a number of odd fables about Ireland. But as I make little use of the writings of these authors, there is no need to notice, to notice them further here. Sometimes, however, passages in the works of foreign writers, when they have had opportunities of coming at facts and leave records of what they knew, afford valuable corroboration of Irish records, of which Bede's account of the students from Britain residing in Ireland and Ethicus's mention of books existing in Ireland in the 4th century are good examples. See chapters, chapter 11, sections 1 and 2 farther on, which we hopefully will do. When we come to the literature of later times, we have, in addition to the native writings in Irish or Latin, many other works, chiefly in English, written by English and foreign writers, and some by Irishmen belonging to the English colony. Geraldus Cambrensis was the first foreigner who wrote a detailed description of Ireland. Of course, we have dealt with him. We've done episodes about Gerald of Wales. He spared no pains to collect materials for his work during his visit in 1185. And his topography of, of Ireland, uh, also called to Topographica Hibernia, or is it top Topographica Hibernica or Topographica Hibernia, um, written in Latin contains a great amount of most interesting and valuable matter. Uh, valuable partly as an independent authority and partly as a confirmation of the native accounts. But he was bitterly prejudiced against the Irish people whom he misrepresents to their disadvantage whenever he finds an opportunity. And he often breaks out into blind, passionate abuse of them. He was very narrow-minded too, and everything... Uh, not exactly squaring in with his own experience of fashion and customs, he pronounced barbarous. Yet he was able to setting the scene for many later uh, authorities, uh, quote, quote marks around authorities, uh, foreigners we might call them. Yet when he was able to conquer his prejudices, he bestowed praise where he thought it was deserved. He describes in enthusiastic terms of laudation, the ornamentation of Irish books and the skill of the Irish harpers. And he praises the Irish clergy for the purity of their lives. Remember, folks, this is uh, uh, pre-Reformation uh, by a few centuries, at least. He was excessively credulous and his book abounds in marvellous stories, some of them very silly, for which Lynch and other Irish writers censure him. 
But in justice to him, it should be mentioned that many of his stories are versions, occasionally distorted, of Irish legends, which must have been related to him or translated from Irish books by natives. And he transferred them all to his book with undiscriminating cre credulity, as if they were sober history. However, in perusing the topography, it is not difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. In the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries, a number of English and Anglo-Irish writers described Ireland and its people. But though the works of several of these are very solid and valuable, many are disfigured by prejudice and misrepresentation, and their testimony has to be carefully sifted. And at section three, which is evidences from material remains, I propose to pause until the next episode, because we have actually tonight read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 pages. Wow. Meetings, that's good going. Hope you all enjoyed that. I think this is going to be a good book. I think there's going to be probably sections of it that will be a little bit where it will be a little bit stilted, but it's a very comprehensive book. I mean, it runs, this is volume one, remember, it runs to over 600 pages, of which we've read only 17. Uh, so this is clearly an excellent resource, a very comprehensive resource. So let us continue in that vein, because I think we enjoyed Squire, but it got to the stage with Squire where, um, why I stopped reading Squire was where he was starting to talk about Brit uh, uh, the mythology of the Britons, which I do intend to come back to, uh, but it was largely dealing with, with uh, uh, British mythology rather than anything that we could call Celtic. I will come back to it. Um, but it just demonstrates yet again, we are uh, on episode, was it 239? And still lots and lots and lots of material for many episodes to come. Um, yeah. Oh, good. There's Peter. Peter, how long have you been there? I didn't see you earlier on. I hope you caught the whole episode. And look, if you didn't, you can replay it now fairly soon when we finish finishes. I love how he uses examples from the literature, which keeps it entertaining. Yeah. Um, and he was wise enough to be able to spot um, uh, the errors, shall it, weigh, shall it be, and the total fabrications, you know. Mythical Ireland reunion, says Anne Scott Doherty. Yeah, let's do it. When? Where? Name the time. Name the place. Let us continue indeed, says Valerie. <laughs> uh, your humour is getting as bad as mine. Some Tommy Cooper humour now before we finish. Do any of you remember, any of you outside Ireland and Britain remember Tommy Cooper? I'm not sure that the American audience will remember. So Tommy Cooper was a very, very funny British comedian and uh, used to wear a fez, you know, uh, this red hat with the, the black streamers on it. And he just had a very funny way of going on, you know, and he looked silly, but he could hold a serious face while also looking silly, which is quite a, a talent, you know. So I knocked on the door at this bed and breakfast and a lady stuck her head out the window and said, what do you want? I said, I want to stay here. And she said, well, stay there. I just shut the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant and there is another one bear with me for a moment because uh, I can't instantly remember it which is terrible I, I, what a terrible shanaki someone is when they can't when they can't remember you should be able to remember you know I went into a French restaurant and I asked the waiter have you got frog's legs he said yes so I said, well, hop into the kitchen and get me a cheese sandwich <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> I think it's time for my chess lesson. But it was good, wasn't it? Wasn't it good? Wasn't it good? <laughs> Thank you, Helen. You have a great week as well. And of course, everybody else. Um, it will be very good, says Caitlin. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, he, he was the influence for Doctor Who wearing a fez, says Michelle. I didn't know that. Wow. Great episode. Thank you, uh, says Adrian. Thank you indeed, Adrian, uh, for that. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, well, uh, thank you greatly, boy. Oh, we love what you do. Keep up, keep, uh, keep up. Keep, what does it exactly say, Anthony? Read it. We love what you do. Keep it up, lad. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, Michael, even. And uh, thank you for 
uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and of course, uh, becoming a patron and buying me a coffee. Uh, yes, support uh, the work of Mythical Ireland in any way that you can. And lots of people laughing at that joke. Well, when I say lots, three Elaine, Chungus, and Mez Marion. Uh, three. Three's a crowd, as far as I'm concerned. That is mass approval for, for that uh, that humor. Uh, but Burr is saying that she can see the tumbleweed. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, uh, uh, Slon live, Igoa, says Josie. And indeed, to all of you, stay safe wherever you are. Hope to see you next week. If not, we might see you. Look, I keep talking about doing these, you know, uh, unplanned live streams from the landscape. I should really, shouldn't I, you know? Um, thank you, Teresa, and uh, to uh, Hallie B04, who is Sue. Uh, thank you. Uh, loved how Tommy deliberately messes up tricks, showing how tricks was done. Great comedian. Never forgot his last show when he fell through the curtain. Yeah. And everybody thought it was part of the act. Yeah, I know. Terrible. But uh, he died doing what he loved doing. And he died making people laugh, literally, you know. Anyway, I hope to see you all very soon. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget, of course, there is a lot of material on the YouTube channel. We have 238 previous episodes there. Don't forget to subscribe on, on Facebook, to like the Facebook page if you are on Facebook. And, of course, uh, don't forget the website is a huge resource. MythicalIreland.com. And if you're there, sign up for the newsletter uh, to keep uh, up to speed with things that are happening. Anyway, take it easy, everybody. Have a fantastic week. A very good evening to you from the Boyne Valley. And all that remains for me to say at this juncture is Ikawa, Kholosov, Slán Gafol, and, of course, more importantly than anything else, Togabogay. Until next time, take it easy. Slow.